Hi everyone, let's have a look through the rhetoric and critical reading Prezi that's posted up on Blackboard. So let's start this discussion by having a quick look at a model for communication. So in the most basic sense, we can think of communication as being a combination of three components. Right? We have a writer or a speaker to produce a message. We have an audience that then receives that message. And we have a subject. The message has to be about something. And this is fairly simplified and probably common sense or intuitive. And sometimes it's helpful to break these common sense notions down into more formal models so that we can figure out how they work. Related to that, we have three different rhetorical strategies, ethos, pathos, and logos. Now, when we're discussing rhetorical strategies, what we're talking about is the study of the art of persuasion. So how do we persuade people? How are we being persuaded as an audience? If we're a speaker, how do we persuade our audience? If we're an audience, how are we persuaded by a speaker or a writer? This doesn't have to be persuasion in the explicit sense of trying to convince someone uh, to follow you or convince someone to vote in a certain way or convince someone to uh, buy a certain product. Uh, almost everything we do and almost everything we say has some component of rhetoric connected to it, whether that's ethos, pathos, or logos. Uh, so it's important to remember the connection between rhetoric and persuasion. When you're studying rhetoric, what you're, stu what you're doing is studying how persuasion works. And the three most basic forms of rhetoric, ethos, pathos, and logos, have, have a long history. Our statue in the middle is Aristotle, and Aristotle formalized or formulated uh, these three different rhetorical strategies. So ethos-based ethos appeals are focused on the character or the expertise or the authority of the writer or the speaker. Pathos-based appeals are rooted in the beliefs or the values or the emotions of the audience. And logos appeals Logos-based appeals are based on the logic or the reasoning or the evidence related to the subject. So how do we establish ourselves as a credible source of information, a credible author? How we conduct research, we acknowledge opposition, how we work to spell everything right, we to be clear and accurate, uh, but we also work to present our appearance in such a way that we, we look like an authority figure or that our essay or our assignment looks like it's providing the correct answers. So ethos-based appeals are rooted in the authority or the character of the writer. Pathos-based appeals are rooted in the emotional response of the audience. In this class, the most obvious audience is me as the instructor. But in many other situations, you'll have other types of audiences, you'll have your peers or your coworkers, maybe you'll be writing for your bosses, or maybe you have community partners. Uh, or in some cases, especially using social media and online platforms, uh, the public can actually end up being your audience. So as a, as a writer, how are you manipulating your audience's emotions to convince them to follow you, to persuade them? And finally, logos. Logos-based appeals are, again, rooted, rooted in the subject. These are connected to uh, the focus of, this, of the communication, the focus of an essay, for example. Uh, also, the support for it, the facts, the figures, uh, the organization, the evidence provided. Also, the words that are used. You'll use different words when writing an email to a friend than you'd use in an academic paper. you use different words when writing a children's story than you would a story for adults. As Aristotle says, the speech itself, insofar as it proves or seems to prove the thing. So we can take our three rhetorical strategies, ethos, pathos, and logos, and map them onto that previous model of writer, speaker, uh, audience, and subject. Right? This simple model of communication, we can use that nice little triangle diagram uh, to help keep track of ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos related to the speaker, the authority of the speaker, pathos rooted in the emotional response of the audience, and logos connected to the subject that's being discussed, how it's discussed, and what evidence is presented. When we're starting to think about 
persuasion and how we persuade our readers, we also need to think carefully about how, when we're reading, texts are working on us to persuade us. And so when we start pulling apart texts to figure out how they're working, we undertake a series of steps that are loosely described as critical reading. I like to summarize this maybe as asking questions about what you're reading. Some of the questions might include, where did the text come from? Who produced the text? Uh, who was the author of the thing? Can we trust that author? Is that author an authority figure? What does the text actually say? Is the logic of it sound? What kind of evidence is presented? Can you trust the writer or the speaker? Uh, in fictional texts, often the speaker, the character, is different from the writer. And so sometimes you need to discern whether or not the voice of the speaker can be trusted. Can the voice of the writer be trusted in an academic text? Again, who is this person and why are they writing? Does, it, does the text effectively use evidence? A lot of the material we'll look at this semester focuses on the effective use of evidence. And I'll be looking carefully at your assignments and how you effectively use evidence to convince your audience that your arguments are, are true and to be persuasive. And last, you might ask yourself, how does the text work? Uh, not only how does it kind of function and how does it hold together, but perhaps more importantly, how does it work on you as a reader? Is it playing on your emotions to help persuade you? Is it focused on a, a logical appeal? Is it rooted in logic? Uh, are you being asked to believe it because of who the author is, who the speaker is, uh, who the voice is that's telling you to believe it, to follow it? Some really concrete strategies for critical reading in our textbook for this class is called Becoming an Active Reader. Despite what the cover suggests, that means more than just running around with your books or doing jumping jacks while holding your books or something. So some concrete strategies for actually critical re undertaking critical reading or reading actively is to write in your books. This, this can sometimes be difficult. We're used to being taught not to write in books or treat books with a certain level of, of respect. And then, well, of course, that's true. When you're consuming these books as students, it's important that you, you mark them up, you write in them, uh, write down notes, underline things you don't understand, highlight things you think are important. It's also important to look things up. Right? If you don't understand the words you're reading, then make sure you look them up. Make connections between chapters, between readings, between the course materials you're being asked to read and the assignments for the course. Also read and then reread and reevaluate. Uh, your opinion often changes across the course of a text, so it can be really instructive to reread material. I sometimes feel like the only time you're actually in any kind of position to start reading something is once you've already read it. It's sometimes useful to write summaries or responses to something. If you're really struggling to figure out what's going on in a text, try writing a summary of it or try writing a response to it, as you'll be doing with the peers' presentations. Look for fallacies of logic or emotion or language. So is the, are the rhetorical strategies breaking down? Is it not convincing you? If there are visual elements of the text, other visual fallacies at work. It can be really easy to mislead people using charts or images. Uh, and also ask yourself, how is the author or the speaker using the rhetorical strategies to persuade the reader, to persuade you? How are ethos, pathos, and logos at work in the text? Off to the side there, there's a little video clip from Braveheart that someone put together uh, I can send a link. To, I can post a link to this on, on the course, Blackboard. But it doesn't really work for the Prezi, so for recording it. Uh, but it's a nice little video that runs through some of these different rhetorical strategies actually at work. Instead of that, let's have a look at some examples of ethos, pathos, and logos used in advertising. We're all familiar with these kind of ads. We see them all the time. The first one suggests that in order to keep your family safe, in order to keep children from being hurt, you need to have Michelin tires. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. Even your kids are riding on your tires. There's no logical or inherent connection between babies and tires. Um, but the ad is making, making us think that. The BMW ad 
and suggesting that uh, drinking driving can lead to severe injuries and that replacing human body parts is not as simple as replacing parts in cars. And so we have this emotional connection to that image, right? The prosthetic lip. And the Coke ad does this even more explicitly. Uh, it doesn't even try to hide the fact that it's using pathos. It says, open a Coke, open happiness, as if Coke and happiness were the same thing. We see, we see pathos used in advertising all the time, and it's often uh, done really effectively. Here are some examples of logos used in advertising, so facts and statistics being presented uh, in advertising. For example, in this ad for uh, Dole juice, we have some quick stats, 120 calories, 100% juice, 100% vitamin C. Now, we're, we tend to believe statistical evidence, and so this is being presented here as an appeal to our logic. Right? These are good reasons, good logical reasons for consuming this juice. Another example from the vitamin water ad, uh, these are the statistics related with Kobe Bryant's career of three championships and counting. Apparently he's consumed 1,845 bottles of vitamin water. I suspect that's not really true. Uh, and has won one MVP award at this point. We also get these nice statistics, 20, more than 20,000 physicians uh, say lucky strikes. It's obviously a slightly older ad. Uh, so we have to be careful about uh, how statistics are being used to persuade us. You can see in the previous example we have a doctor on the left and Kobe Bryant on the right. So we can see that this is actually starting to incorporate other strategies as well. So not only do we have the statistical evidence and the facts that are being presented to us, right, the logo based appeals, but we also have an authority figure in the doctor and a celebrity in the figure of Kobe Bryant. And so we start to see a whole other type of rhetorical strategy at work here. This is the ethos-based strategy. So ethos in advertising is used all the time. Here we have a someone who's recommending a certain type of toothpaste to us. Uh, she's recommending it quite a lot. And we believe this person because she's wearing, she matches the appearance of a doctor. She's wearing a, a doctor's coat or a lab coat. Uh, and it tells us there, Dr. Alexander Smith, a dentist in Chicago. We also get words like expert and plus. Right? We know to trust this person because they're an authority on the subject. Similarly, we need to we know to trust David Beckham uh, because he's an authority on being incredibly cool, and so we should drink Pepsi in order to be incredibly cool like David Beckham. But there's no logical connection between Beckham and Pepsi. And as an athlete, he probably drank actually very little Pepsi, uh, but the authority that he carries as a cultural figure is what's convincing us that drinking Pepsi is good, in the same way that the authority a doctor has is convincing us that we should use Sensodyne toothpaste. Similarly, of course, if we want to be as amazing as James Bond, we need to have an Omega watch. James Bond is the authority on being cool, much like David Beckham, and we can only hope to reach that state if we have an Omega watch. Let's have a look at a few examples. These are taken from some of the texts you might, we might actually read this semester. Linford Christie, who served a two-year ban, drug ban from athletics competition, said that athletics is so corrupt now, I wouldn't want my child doing it. So which of the three rhetorical strategies, ethos, pathos, or logos, is most dominant in this quote? We could argue that a couple of different strategies are actually at work. For me, because of who Linford Christie is, a former sprinter, this quote is based most in ethos. It's the authority of the person speaking that carries the most weight, that does the most persuading. If it was my neighbor Jeff uh, said that athletics is so corrupt now I wouldn't want my child doing it, it wouldn't mean as much to me as the fact that a former disgraced Olympic medal winner is telling us that it's so corrupt that he wouldn't want his child doing it. So for me, this is a ethos-based approach in this quote. Coding isn't some niche, niche skill, it really is the new literacy. It's the essential 21st century skill that every ambitious person needs to learn if they want to succeed. 
don't believe me, just look at the legal profession. Software is turning it inside out and causing mass unemployment for the lawyers who can't code. For me, this actually contains a couple of different rhetorical strategies at the same time. There's certainly some logic in this. It's telling us to look at the legal profession and saying, if lawyers can't get jobs, then what chance do we have of getting a job? There's kind of a logical uh, persuasion technique at work here. We tend to hold lawyers in fairly high esteem, and so the suggestion that they can't get jobs because they can't code should be somewhat bothersome to us if we're not lawyers yet, or we don't have quite as high of a position in society. So the logical conclusion we should make is that we should also learn how to code. So there's definitely a logos-based appeal at work in this passage. I think there's also an e a pathos-based appeal here as well. Uh, this don't believe me question, it's almost like a, a challenge to us, uh, or a threat maybe, or a uh, we're building some kind of connection to the speaker of this when we're being addressed directly through the through the me. So I think there is kind of a pathos-based appeal at work in this as well, in addition to the logos-based appeal. Just yesterday, it was the city of Victoria. Maxine Davis, executive director of the Dr. Peter AIDS Foundation, told McLean's. So even if we don't know who Maxine Davis is, and I don't know who she is, we're being told here that she's the executive director of the Dr. Peter AIDS Foundation. That means in this situation, she probably knows more about this topic than we do, and so we trust her because of her authority. Now, of course, we don't just trust people blindly because they're authority figures, but that's the strategy that's being used here in this writing. We're being told who she is and the position she occupies as a way of convincing us to believe her. Also, we might recognize McLean's as a fairly high-profile Canadian publication, and so we recognize that as a, an authority, as a publisher, or as a publishing platform. In the six months following the disaster, more than 4.3 million families received food assistance, and more than 900,000 vaccinations of children and adults were carried out. For me, this is mostly a logos-based appeal, or a logos-based rhetorical strategy at work. We have some statistics here that are being used to provide evidence of the topic under discussion. There's not a lot of inflated language here to appeal to our emotion, emotions, so I wouldn't say that it's pathos-based. And we also don't even know who the speaker is. So the authority of the speaker is not really in question. We don't know who that is, so we can't determine whether or not we will leave this material based on the speaker. So I would say that this is mostly based in, almost exclusively based in logos. Pathos and ethos aren't really a consideration. Now, if the quote had said something like, in the six months following the disaster, more than 4.3 you know, destitute and hungry families received vital food assistance and more than 900,000 necessary vaccinations of you know, adorable children with enormous dimples uh, and adults who were sad and weeping in the street were carried out, then we could see that as an appeal based on our emotional response, right? A pathos-based appeal. Program or be programmed. Again, this one contains what I think are a couple of different rhetorical strategies that work. There's a certain logic to this, program or be programmed. Uh, but again, so it falls within the uh, logos-based appeal. But there's also a certain emotional response we have to this. It sounds kind of like a threat in a way. Uh, and so we might respond to that emotionally. And so there's a pathos-based rhetorical strategy being used as well, I might argue. This is simply a part of a mathematical proof. This is an entirely logic-based example. We may not know what's actually going on in this. I certainly don't. Um, but the assumption is that math is rooted in logic, and so this is an entirely logos-based appeal. We're convinced of this because of the logic of a thing. We don't know who the author is, so it's not ethos-based. We have no emotional connection to this. Unless you're, unless you're particularly emo emotionally connected to x minus y, which seems to feature a lot, um, but you're probably not. So it's, I'd say, entirely a logos-based argument being made here. 
The French Revolution, which began in 1789, sparked a revolt of Haiti's middle class and an uprising of its slave majority. Again, for me, this is logos-based. We have some historical data, some historical material, uh, and there's some reading of that situation being presented to us uh, with dates and facts to back it up. Almost entirely logos-based. We don't know who the speaker is. There's not much of an emotional appeal. A few, a woman in a black leather coat who looked too young for the weight of her troubles, and others who looked too small for their clothes, were twitching and drug sick and raging at the world. For me, this is almost exclusively a pathos based appeal. We, start, we feel sympathy for the characters who are being presented here, uh, and so we have an emotional response to it. We don't know who the speaker is, so we're not going to evaluate whether or not the speaker is an authority figure. So it's not ethos based. Uh, it's also not. There might be some logical connections made throughout that quote, but I'd say the majority of the persuasion is done through our emotional response to it. And finally, will you help them? Your support makes a difference. Look at those big eyes. This is entirely a pathos-based appeal. Our emotions are being manipulated by this puppy, and the message is, your support, your money makes a difference, so please donate to help save this puppy. So as you start working through some of our active reading exercises, and when you start thinking about your own composition processes, it's important to think about the ways that ethos, pathos, and logos feature. When we start to think about how to analyze text and pull them apart, I want you thinking carefully about how these three specific rhetorical strategies are at work how they're at work to persuade the audience, how they're at work to convince you to follow the argument that's being made. 